the organization that I co-founded with Aaron Jen. We're excited to have you here. We're excited to be in Miami. As I mentioned earlier, this event would not be possible without our generous sponsor. So really quickly, uh, Freddie Figures, uh, Figures Communications. Thank you, Figure, Figures Wireless. Thank you for being here. Um, Jeffrey Meyerson with Software Engineering Daily. Someone raise your hand, Jeffrey, if you are here. All right, somewhere in the room, thank you for being here. And then Sumit with Original Capital. Uh, I know your team is here, but thank you for your, for your support. Um, introducing Peter and uh, Bambi will be a, a friend of Lincoln. Uh, he is a serial entrepreneur, uh, a prolific uh, angel investor, seed investor, and, uh, and a friend of Lincoln's. Uh, from the great state of Pennsylvania, uh, Paul Martino, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Garrett. As, as Garrett said, my name is Paul Martino. I am losing my voice a little bit. I run a fund out of Silicon Valley called Bullpen Capital. I've recently been in the news a lot because I had this crazy idea about getting K through, kid, K through 12 kids back into school in spite of COVID. It's made me a lot of friends. Uh, we run, run a pack called Back to School PA. So I've not been afraid to be at the intersection of politics and technology, which can sometimes be dangerous. Part of the reason I was invited here is Bambi and I have hosted Peter for multiple events in the past, and I'm holding her book, which I highly encourage you to read. Because this conversation you're going to hear now is, I think, going to be very unexpected if you usually come to a tech event. Bambi's book is a highly personal description of what it's like to grow up as a Christian conservative in Silicon Valley and be part of a modern-day mixed marriage. Her husband, Ezra, who is here, is the liberal of the crew. The book is a bit of a didactic about how to get along, how to listen to what the other person is saying, something that we don't have a lot of in this modern day. The book specifically is called Unequally Yoked, and the yoke refers to, in many ways, the social contract under which all of us have with one another and the current culture wars which are trying to upend that social contract. Uh, so I highly encourage you to read it. This is, as I said, the fourth or fifth time I've had the pleasure of hosting uh, Bambi and Peter at an event. If you saw the promo materials for this particular event, there was this nice picture of Bambi sitting with Peter next to a plant. Uh, I was the MC of that event, and I can tell you it is a very thankless job to have to speak after Peter. So I'm very pleased that I get to speak before Peter this time. And I think what's important to understand is that this conversation is about the intersection of politics, technology, and perhaps most surprisingly, religion. In order to actually understand Peter's philosophy and the so-called telus that now follow, you can't understand it unless you understand that he's a deeply Christian person. And that's one of the things that he is going to spend quite a bit of time talking about with Bambi. And so by having Bambi, who's written a book about a modern-day mixed marriage, who's a deep Christian herself, interview Peter, I think you're going to hear something very different than what you're used to hearing at an event of this kind. So this isn't going to be the story about tell me about the first time that you met Mark Zuckerberg or tell me what it was like when you wrote a check to so-and-so. This is going to be about who Peter is, what drives him, and how he thinks. And i got to tell you, Peter is not just one of the great business minds of our time, but he is one of the great contrarian and deep thinkers, a real student of human nature. So it is my pleasure to be able to introduce Bambi and Peter. And i got to tell you, buckle up. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> great to see you again, Peter. Good to see you. That's your prop, so you don't have to wear a mask. This is my prop, so we wouldn't have to wear a mask. We, we were coming from California, so we weren't sure of the protocol. 
Um, so we wanted to make sure that just in case we wanted to walk around, we just have a cookie um, because then your COVID, COVID immunity. Um, that's actually not my idea. Apparently college students are apparently walking around on college campuses without masks, but they have to have a cookie because then, then they get a free pass. So, but we're <laughs> not gonna talk about COVID. We're gonna talk about something less controversial, religion. <laughs> so uh, first I wanna thank Paul. I also wanna thank Lincoln for hosting this and everyone here for wanting to hear this discussion. And of course, Peter for wanting to have this discussion with me. Now, um, it's always tough to talk about religion. It's really fraught with risk that we are possibly going to offend someone or maybe unquestionably we will offend someone tonight. Um, but we have to talk about it because our Judeo-Christian foundation is what underlies our culture, our morality. And if we want to steward this country well, we have to understand the lineage of our beliefs. But unfortunately, society has become desensitized and sometimes hostile to our spiritual heritage. And a lot of that is due to our quest and our craving for rational and scientific explanations for our beliefs. And, and that's, had, that's had profound impacts on our culture, um, whether it's how we understand the human condition to how we define our identity to how we define our relationships with one another, our social contracts. And Paul mentioned my book, Unequally Yoked. It is about our yokes we have with each other. And we're all yoked together in different ways. Man to society, uh, parent to child, teacher to student, manager to worker. And all of these yokes are beautiful gifts. They're beautiful gifts that bring us together in this sort of combined and unified journey to build something greater than ourselves. See, our identity is more relational than we know. It's not that individualistic. But these yokes for so many people these days are starting to feel like burdens. And I think as Paul mentioned, everybody wants to rip off their yokes. Everyone wants to tear apart these social contracts and start anew, and this is the culture war we live in. And in my book, I talk about how some people or half the country see this painting of the world they know, and it's fading in the past, fading away. And the other half sees this painting, and they think it's a fake, and it's not fading fast enough. So what about technology? What does technology do? Well, history has shown that technology has often made sweeping changes to our social order. And so just as an example, in the 1500s to the Enlightenment, we had the Industrial Revolution, we had the printing press, we had the steam turbine, we had knitting machines, and all of this enabled the division of labor, expanded trade, made everyone more informed. And what happened was we went from a feudal system to a capitalist system. Now you heard the last panel talk about all these new technologies. We are venturing into space. Virtual economy was birthed in 2020 uh, in earnest. And how is that going to change our social order? Um, how is that going to change? Will we move from a capitalist system to something different? Um, so we're gonna unpack that. And of course, Peter will be no less than profound, I'm sure. Um, but first, we are gonna start off talking about freedom. Because we are here, of course, Peter and I traveled here from California. Um, it feels a little bit freer. Um, you know, let me start off with uh, a quote from a very, very well-known philosopher. And um, let's see, where is he? Oh yeah, He's, his name is Draymond Green. Okay, he said, you say we live in the land of the free. Well, you're not giving an, anyone freedom because you're making people do something. That goes against everything America supposedly stands for. Green, of course, is referring to the vaccine mandates. That's taking away the freedom from basketball players to play basketball in New York unless they get mandated. Of course, we have the Pharisee who lives in the governor's mansion in New York who is invoking God and imploring all her apostles to spread the good news and it's not the gospel it's the vaccine mandates and of course in new york city 
there's no freedom for children to pursue straight A's and be recognized. In Virginia, there's no freedom for parents to have a say in their kids' education. And not only should parents have a say, they have an obligation. And so, as I mentioned, we, we flew here from California, and California is the first state to have K through 12 mandates for vaccine mandates. And so we, that's one of the reasons why we're here. It's one of the freer states, as many of you heard in our last panel. So the first question I want to ask Peter is, you know, how do you define freedom in Miami? And how do we maintain it? And I think Helen brought up a great point is that, unfortunately, great people create these societies and attract all these parasites, and then it degenerates. So how do we keep it free? Um, well, this is sort of so multifaceted. I, uh, it's hard to know where, where exactly to begin. But I, obviously, we have, you know, um, you know, you have freedom has sort of many different dimensions. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's sort of a you know, annoying regulatory version that's somehow been been hit home really hard in the in, in with all the insanity of uh, of, the, of the last uh, 20 months with with, with COVID. There are um, you know there's freedom from excessive taxation, which I'm really into. There is um, there is uh, but you know and, and of course you have freedom of speech, freedom of religion. You have freedom, you know, freedom the, the right to remain silent and not to answer questions from um, from you know, everybody in the media, yourself accepted. So um, there are all sorts of different dimensions of freedom. One could one could talk about, you know, probably one that, that I um, that I keep circling back to, and I'm not sure it's the, the most important, but is something like freedom of thought. It's it, you know, it's it's uh, I, I never like the word contrarian because that always just sounds like you're just attaching a negative minus sign to what everybody else thinks. But it's it's really you know the freedom to think for yourself, the, the freedom um, for um, some kind of some kind of independent thought, and uh, and that feels, um, you know, that feels under assault in um, in an extreme way in you know California, the United States, the the Western world, you know, many other places. There's of course even even less than in um, America or in, or in Florida, and um, and um, and that's sort of that's there's sort of a constellation of things around that I. I've often thought that the biggest political problem we have, you know, is, is the problem of political correctness, of the sort of, you know, um, you know, incredible sort of um, um, homogenization, um, standardization, where everybody in society, you know, thinks the same way, you know, is not is not allowed to think think differently. Um, it's 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 you know, in some ways, um, an odd juxtaposition with the, you know, Judeo-Christian history, because uh, one would have said. You know, maybe in in the 17th or the mid 18th century, it was sort of the, the, the people who styled themselves as deists or you know um, rationalists or free thinkers were the anti-church people. The church was accused of being excessively dogmatic, and somehow the, the heterodoxy was you know um, were, were people who styled themselves in in opposition to that. And what's what's very odd. Is uh, is that somehow if you fast forward from let's say 1750 to to 2021, it is you know it's 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 probably quite the opposite. Where I think uh, again, it's you know hard to know how one would measure these things, but if if one if one spoke to people who are um, you know relatively orthodox Christians, um, they are probably the most heterodox, independent thinkers left in this country. And that's Sort of an interesting, you know, sociological thing, you know, an interesting, um, just an interesting fact. I was, I was uh, catching up with one of my my friends at, uh, as a professor, tenured professor at Stanford. He's, uh, I think he's one of he's um, he's one of the uh, um, anti-restriction, COVID health economists, and has sort of just been, you know, persecuted or you know, sort of just you know, don't want to exaggerate it, but you know. Uh, uh, deplatform, not allowed to speak on campus. You know, there's sort of I think I think he was describing me. There was somebody who put up uh, posters of him and DeSantis all over campus, and uh, and there was a petition by the on, by the faculty where they tried to get him, you know, not to say anything anymore. And it was just you know it was just these sort of basic cost benefit calculations of you know, um, you know, um, do the restrictions work? You know, how many people are dying because they can't get other health care? 
you know, maybe maybe we've maybe the you know the COVID epidemic is actually just an obesity epidemic, which is much worse. So even if you just analyze it simply as a health thing, because health is the absolute. He was just asking a bunch of questions like this, and he was telling me, you know, um, it would have been really tough to get through the last 20 months if he didn't have some kind of transcendental faith in something. Um, it, he would have just had to sort of cave in, cave in to the crowd. You know, I, I always think there are, um, you know, the you sort of think of the Ten Commandments, the, uh, there's something about maybe the first and last being the most important, and the first commandment is always, you know, you should worship God and nobody else. And the Tenth Commandment is, you know, you shouldn't covet, you shouldn't um, want too much of the things that the people around you have and, and want. And you can think of them as sort of, the first one says you should always look up, and the Tenth is you shouldn't look around too much. And there's something about, you know, when you stop looking up, when you stop having some kind of, transcendent uh, frame of reference, um, you get caught up too much in looking around, and it's too much of this, um, you know, sort of um, mob consensus, um, epistemically closed fake, fake system. Or sort of, that, that, that would be sort of like the first, tenth commandment way of putting it. Let me try, let me try one other, one other big picture framing of this, where, you know, in a, in a, in a democracy, we, we broadly think that, you know, if, 51% of the population is, is more right than wrong. And then, of course, you know, if you get up to 70%, that's even, that's even more, more accurate. But if you get to 99.99% agreement, you're not in a democracy, you're in North Korea. And, um, and so there is sort of this question, where do, you, where do you sort of transition from, let's say, the wisdom of crowds to the madness of crowds? You know, where's... Where is that? Where is that uh, break point? And, and I think sort of the you know the two, you know the two big you know traditions of, of the Western world. One is sort of the classical rationalist tradition, and that's always says that you should believe in you know the wisdom of crowds. That there's some sort of community of intelligent people. What they think is probably true, and you should always lean into that. And um, and then I, I do think the you know Judeo-Christian tradition is always sort of um, the uh, the more um, is the opposite of it, where I, I, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I believe every single occasion in the Bible where there's unanimity, it's always, the unanimity is always wrong. It's always wrong, whether it's Tower of Babel or, you know, um, you know various stories of, you know, everybody abandoning Christ. Um, you know, so, so reason tells us you should believe in the wisdom of crowds, and uh, revelation tells us... Um, you should be aware of the madness of crowds, and there's always a question, you know, where does where does reason end, and where does revelation begin? And I think we're, you know, we're we're in a world that's that's leaned a little bit too far into the wisdom of crowds, and any corrective of that would be would be very healthy indeed. And we're just getting started, and it, it's it's great to have this forum because I, I see a lot of writings uh, about Peter. I'm going to mention a couple here, and sometimes. Um, I look at them and it's like reading a profile about Jesus written by the Romans. They just don't understand at all. So we're going to try to get tease that out of Peter here. Um, there's because there's been a lot written about Peter, um, particularly his influence in Silicon Valley and how that will carry over to the country. So here's one from the New York Post. Teal is quote almost impossible to understand. May 2021 in The New Yorker, it says, Teal and the Tealists are a through line from the party's recent past to its likely future. So basically, it's the future of the party. Uh, if Silicon Valley culture that you shaped is the future of the GOP party, then you talked a little bit about freedom, but what are your thoughts about freedom and democracy? Again, this is like, this feels like a sort of question that would take me an hour to try to unpack, so I don't even know where to begin there. Um, I, I certainly... You know, think that uh, I'm always bad at answering these sort of self psychoanalysis type questions. But um, you know, I think of you know, in some ways, I'm an I'm a Silicon Valley insider. In some ways, I'm also an outsider and uh, and a critic. And um, and probably, you know, certainly, um, you know, one of one of the themes that I've spoken about for 13, 14 years now very consistently, I think it's very simple and very basic, is just, you know, this question about the nature of technological progress. You know, how much is happening, 
how fast is it happening? Um, you know, sort of very complicated questions about you know how one measures it, um, and um, and um, but what what can we say about um, the progress of the whole? Uh, is is it happening at this sort of dizzying speed? And you know, are we accelerating towards utopia or dystopia? Sort of, you know, Ray Kurzweil, the singularity is near, and all you have to sit back and you know, eat your popcorn and watch the movie of the future unfold? Or is it sort of, you know, and then of course there are sort of a whole range of sort of much more, much more dystopian versions. And, um, and the, the sort of, um, I think, somewhat unfashionable view that I've, I have articulated is that uh, it seems to me there, there isn't, you know, as much progress happening as advertised, and that uh, rather than um, racing towards utopia or dystopia, the, the much bigger problem is one of, you know, relative stagnation. It is, you know, and it, it sort of manifests economically in that, you know, for the first time we have a younger generation that's, you know, not clearly doing better than their parents. We have all sorts of complexities in measurement we could, we could go into. Um, we sort of came up with a tagline for this about a decade ago where, you know, um, in, our, in a manifesto we wrote for Founders Fund, you know, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters, which again is not an argument against Twitter as a, as, as a company. It's, pro it's probably, you know, on some level it's a phenomenally successful company. You have, you know, very cushy jobs for thousands of people. They can go to work or they can smoke marijuana all day. It doesn't really matter. It's, 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 it's fantastic as a, as a, as a, as a company. But, um, but the, the, the larger social political question is, um, is, you know, how does, does this take our society is this actually really transforming our society and taking it to the next level? Even though, you know, obviously, it's the communications technologies are culturally can be transformative, but you know, how much are they delivering economically? And are, is this really as um, as dramatic a future as say going from the horse to the, the car or indoor plumbing? Or you know, if you had a choice of you know um, getting rid of jet travel and going back to horses than cars and uh, getting rid of indoor plumbing. And you match that against, you know, getting rid of, let's say, the internet. Um, it, it's that that sort of tells you. You know, my, my guess is most of us would would um, keep the first three, and uh, and that tells us something about the, um, you know, the internet's not a small invention, but it's it's uh, it's not been quite as big as, as always advertised. I think that's that's sort of a a, a framing that that I've had, and then and then this is. Um, this is probably, there are all sorts of ways this is, you know, very difficult to articulate in Silicon Valley because the propaganda of Silicon Valley is to talk about, you know, um, the, the Google propaganda or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, is to talk about how, how great Silicon Valley is and, you know, how, how wonderful it is. And, um, and, you know, there's sort of a lot of things that one could say, you know, pro or anti President Trump, but I thought, you know, if you think about his, his, his slogan, make America great again, you know, there's there's one version of it where this is a you know it's a ridiculous um, thing. It's never going to happen. But um, but I, I think of it as you know somehow the most honest and pessimistic slogan of any presidential candidate in a hundred years because it's saying we're no longer as great a country as uh, as we claim to be. And um, and then it's of course taken extremely personally in a place like Silicon Valley where people think they're building a great future. And, uh, and you have to sort of understand the slogan as having been sort of, you know, a direct, you know, a direct existential challenge. And um, in a way that, it, you know, people were offended in New York or Los Angeles, but uh, you know, nobody on Wall Street or Hollywood really believes they're, they're making the country a better place. And so it was sort of, it was much more offensive to, uh, to Silicon Valley. But, uh, but I think that, you know, I think instead of simply being offended, you know, it would be it would be constructive to try to actually ask the question. You know, you know, what parts of technology are actually accelerating and progressing really quickly? What parts are transformative? And then, um, you know, where are we where are we stuck? And uh, you know, I, I can sort of riff on that a lot more. But yeah. yeah, no, I want to talk about technology and innovation, but I want to also stick with uh, democracy and freedom. Um, because you talked about stagnation, and in some ways maybe we could be afraid or maybe we could be okay that we're just stagnating um, because, as Helen mentioned, it could get worse. Um, but I want to quote, I want to read this quote 
Quote, from our recent experience, it is clear that the traditional liberties of speech and opinion rest on no solid foundation. Time and energy that should go building and restoring are instead consumed in warding off the pinpricks of prejudice and fighting a guerrilla war against misunderstanding and intolerance. That's very appropriate for today, isn't it? Um, yeah, so look, there's a lot that one can say about, um, about democracy. I always, I always think it's somewhat of a loaded word. I'm probably mildly anti-democracy in all these ways. But, uh, but of course, the, the point you could say in the U.S. is we're not supposed to be a democracy. We're supposed to be a republic, and then not even a pure republic, but we're supposed to be a constitutional republic. And so there's always you know, some distrust of, of, um, of simply um, having sort of uh, voting plebiscites in this country with sort of a, a somewhat healthy distrust of the mob. Um, that being said, um, you know, the, the thing that I think um, is an important function of, uh, of democracy and of, of voting generally is, um, is as a sort of check on, um, on our elites. And, um, and the question, you know, one has to ask is, um, you know, how, how good a job um, the elites have been doing. And I think that's, that's what a lot of, you know, the debates about, you know, um, um, is there, is demo how much democratic participation, how much are average people supposed to uh, participate in the larger debates in our country. The, the inverse side of that is this question about how good a job you know, our elites have been doing. And I, I again sort of come down on the side that they've done you know, a pretty, pretty bad job. And, um, and you know, democracy obviously doesn't mean just voting for the Democratic Party. It also, um, it also shouldn't just mean something simply political where you, know, you, get, you get to choose, do you, like, you know, do you like the angry grandma or do you like the man with a strange hairdo in 2016, or it's, you know, that's, that's, if it's just these sort of simple political things, that's like, um, you know, there's sort of all these other topics that uh, the question is, should average people, um, you know, should the broad public be allowed to uh, have debates, not just about politics, but also about things that are more important, like technology, or religion, or philosophy, or, um, you know, all of, all of these, or science. And, uh, and that's, that's of course, uh, that's of course one of the, you know, one of the kinds of questions that um, came into very sharp relief in the, in the last uh, in the last 20 months, where you know the conceit was that uh, that um, that uh, something as elevated as science, you know, should definitely be left out of out of touch of of of, um, of our average citizens. They they, they 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 shouldn't be able to think about these things. And um, and I guess my my at least mildly pro-democracy thing is that uh, I think the experts were, were pretty bad and, and found to be pretty wanting. Did and that it's probably, you know, healthy not to, you know, maybe, maybe you can be pro-science, but you should definitely not believe in science with a capital S. Right. And there's a criticism of democracy, too, that, uh, and by the way, that quote that I quoted was from 1922, so it's 100 years old, and that was Walt Littman. And so his critique on democracy is, and as you were talking about, you know, are people well informed, or is it, are they hearing propaganda? And that's Walt Lippmann's problem with democracy is that it's not really, it can't be a democracy if people aren't well informed because the news is all propaganda. And yeah, so but I, but again, I think once if, if we set the debate too much in in those terms, then um, then um, you know you are simply going to let um, the elite. The, um, the administrative state, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, it will be allowed to do whatever it wants. And so I, I, don't, I don't know if I care whether people are that well informed. I want them just to be able to have some kind of basic check. I want them to be able to say, you know, the people in charge aren't, um, don't seem to be doing that well. Let's, let's vote them out. Let's replace them with other people. Um, at, at least that, that sort of a, you know, of a level of dissent, I think, is what we want. You know, um, Obviously, there's a there's a big um, issue of let's say misinformation, fake news. We're in this sort of weird postmodern world where you know it's, it's very hard to figure out what's uh, what's what's really going on. And yet, it it seems to me that um, the much greater problem would be to try to you know the solution to solve the problem of misinformation with some kind of centralized ministry of truth. Mm -hmm seems so much, that seems like, you know, it's whatever, the SAT word is aetrogenic, it's a cure that's worse than the disease. And, um, and, uh, and but then again, this goes to sort of this, this question we started with, which is, 
you know, what is the nature of misinformation? You know, what, what is the nature of the, of, of the problem? Is it that people are, you know, that they are too, um, too credulous and too likely to believe fake things? Or is it that people are too skeptical of, um, of, of, of the official stuff? Or, you know, the, the philosophy of science way to frame this is that I often think you could think of the self-understanding what science was supposed to do was fight a two-front war against excessive dogmatism and against excessive skepticism. So you can only have science if people are too dogmatic and say, you know, the earth is flat, can't ask any questions. If excessive dogmatism is bad for science. And then if you have excessive skepticism, which is you can never know anything, don't believe anything, you know, how do I even know you're sitting there, Bambi? Um, you know, if you have a world of excessive skepticism, that also doesn't work. And so somehow skepticism, dogmatism, you know, are two opposite things. So you have to, to, to do science well, you have to somehow, you know, find this middle course between the, let's say, the charybdis of dogmatism and the scylla of skepticism. And of course, the, you know, the problem, you know, if I had to riff on this a little bit more, you know, the, the history is that, of course, you know, in, the, in its 17th, 18th century forms, science, you know, was articulated as against dogmatic central authorities, you know, in, in the form of, let's say, the Catholic Church or, or, or things of, of that sort, um, the monarchy, you know, uh, things of that sort. And that's, of course, still the way scientists style themselves. But um, if, you, if you look at it, it's, it seems to me that it's, it's completely the opposite at this point. And it is, it is just, you know, an all-out war against dissent, against skepticism, against heterodoxy, so, um, you know, and, and so it's, uh, can't question climate change, you can't question, you know, um, that vaccines are simply good, that there's no cost benefits to vaccines. So there's a whole set of things where um, it's, it's, um, it's anti-skepticism and therefore it's way too far on the side of dogmatism. And so, um, I don't know, you know, if, if it's a choice between misinformation and a ministry of truth, I, th I think we would be in a much healthier society if we had, you know, somewhat more skepticism, somewhat more misinformation, somewhat more crazy conspiracy theories. All that stuff would be such a healthy corrective to, to the sort of, um, you know, I don't know, with the, ultra, the sort of centralized totalitarian one-world state. Okay. Another way you'd... <laughs> Another way you frame this, and we've talked about this before, is um, this is the, the woke culture. It is, uh, and part of it is this uh, willful distorting of reality, this constant willful distorting of reality. Actually, it's one of the reasons why I also wrote my book, Unequally Yoked, because I felt like there's just such misunderstanding around this one view, which is more of a conservatism, it's more of a Christian worldview. And, um, and I put the book out there, had a lot of really good examples of where you could see two different interpretations of facts, and there is just no changing minds. It is a dogmatism, I believe, on, on, on that side. But I, I want to start with what is the woke culture? What, everybody's yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's much worse, of course, than what you're saying. It's dogmatic, but it's, uh, people have changed their minds so much. You know, I mean, it was uh, Kamala Harris one year ago, I will never take a Trump vaccine. Or, you know, a year and a half ago, um, you didn't need to wear a mask because there was a shortage of masks. We need to lie to people about it. Um, you know, was it the food market or the Wuhan lab? It seems to have shifted more to the Wuhan lab, but that was just, you know, it's, it's just, it is, um, it is completely, it's very dogmatic, but it's, it is, um, it's, uh, we've had these hairpin loop 180 degree turns. So it's, it's been, uh, it's been uh, dogmatic in an unbelievably incoherent way, but um, but yeah, I think I think one um, one one way of getting at it is always this question of whether you know the whatever you want to call this, this new culture is it um, you know is it sort of again is it excessively skeptical or is it excessively dogmatic? And the excessive skepticism thing would be that it's let's say relativistic. It's 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 a form of, in moral relativism would be sort of the, the ethical expression of excessive skepticism. You can't know anything, um, and maybe, um, and then, um, and then um, the excessive dogmatism is, um, gets expressed politically or ethically as a, as a sort of totalitarianism. 
And, uh, and this is why, you know, even though there's probably some very interesting link between, you know, um, a relativistic questioning of all truth and a sort of totalitarian dogmatism, um, it seems to me we, we should always frame it as, you know, much more totalitarian than relativist, much more dogmatic than, um, than skeptical. It's, um, you know, th there's, there's always sort of a question of how, uh, how to link it historically. You know, I think, um, I think people have often described um, the woke thing as a, as a kind of religion. Um, and I, I think we should, you know, be, be much more specific. And this is where, you know, I, you know, maybe we disagree a little bit on this, but I, I think of it as, as actually a specific form of, of Christianity or maybe a, a specific, maybe, it's, maybe you could call it a Christian heresy, that's maybe too strong, but it's sort of a, 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 a very specific sort of thing that, um, that can only happen in a, in a, you know, very sort of Christian society where, you know, if, if you lose faith in Christ and the resurrection of Christ, in one sense, in theory, everything goes. I mean, you can become a Nietzschean Superman. You can, you know, you can sort of become, you know, um, you know, a relativistic person who just plays video games in a basement. I mean, sort of, in, a the in theory, everything goes. Ayn Rand, all, all these different things. In practice, it always, the overwhelming tendency seems to be towards something like um, politically correct wokeness, um, you know, hyper-Christianity, communism, different things like this. And I would, I would suggest that there's nothing that new about it. I think it was the social gospel in the early 20th century. I think it was, it was communism in the 19th century, and, you know, maybe Marcion in the second century. Um, and, um, and what it was always, what animated these things was always some idea like we we're going to be more Christian than the Christians, if, if you sort of had to articulate it as one way. And so to use communism as an illustration, it would be that you know, maybe, maybe in the Middle Ages, two most important attributes of Christ were, you know, his divinity. Maybe the second most important was that Christ was poor. And any time you saw a poor person on the street, it might be Christ in disguise, and how you treated that person, would, uh, you'd be held to account at the, at the last judgment. Um, and, um, and then, you know, in some sense, the, the move that, you know, uh, Marx and Engels and Tolstoy and people like that made, you know, in the 19th century was, you know, the Christians aren't doing enough for the poor, and we're going to do even more. And uh, we're going we're gonna to have, um, you know, we're going to have heaven on earth, and we're going to be prepared to kill millions of people to show how serious we are. And, um, and we're, it's, it's, we're, we're doing more. And then uh, I think there's a, there's a social gospel version of this, and probably, you know, there, there's something about the Judeo-Christian tradition history where it always takes the side of the victim. To, you know, it's, it's Cain and Abel versus Romulus and Remus, same story, different perspective. You know, Genesis, you take, in the book of Genesis, you take the side of Abel against Cain and the, 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 the whole community. Um, in the Romulus and Remus story, you know, the founding of the first city of the history of the world versus the founding of the greatest city of the ancient world. Case of Rome, it's, you know, um, Romulus is right, Remus gets killed, he's, um, you know, it's the city is right, the individual is, is, is wrong. So there is, there is sort of a, you know, a, a, a way in which um, I, I think of Judaism and Christianity as the anti-mythology. You know, the standard mythology would be told from the perspective of Egypt. We had, you know, these troublesome people, and they finally, the troublemakers were finally driven out. And, but it's, it's told from, from the point of view of, of, of the Jews. And, uh, and then, of course, there's, a, there's a, a New Testament version of this, too. And, um, and so there is something, you know, that is, you know, I think essentially Christian about this, this concern for victims. And, um, and then um, there is something about that, uh, that can get weaponized and, and radicalized. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's why I think, I think something like the woke thing won't happen in, you know, it, does, it doesn't happen in, let's say, I don't know, I'm not sure there really are any parts that are, haven't been impacted by Christianity, but it's, it's, it's harder to be woke in, let's say, Saudi Arabia or in, um, or in, um, or, or in maybe, maybe Japan is the developed country that's sort of the least Christian. So it's kind of hard to be woke in Japan or in Saudi Arabia where you haven't been influenced by these ideas for centuries to quite the same intensity. Yeah, no, this is where Peter and I somewhat disagree, but I, maybe it's just nomenclature, but I do believe it's recurring. Like you said, we've seen this movie before. 
Um, but I believe that it's very anti-Christian. So you see, and we're talking about the woke religion or woke culture. So uh, it certainly has lots of roots in Marx and historical materialist. You know, Marx believes that uh, matter is primary, consciousness is secondary. So everything is starts from a material base, and how we create that material base is based on economics. So how we structure ourselves in society around the production of goods, and that in of itself is a, is an ideology. And the those in the ruling class create that ideology. Those in the ruling class create that morality. So to me. I see whoever's in the ruling class, again, this is the Marxist view, is the class that creates that morality, so it's very malleable. Um, and the woke culture, they also believe that the human condition is inherently good. So uh, that's very Freud, very Rousseau. Um, it's not about, uh, it's about the systems, it's about the parents, it's about anybody but yourself. Um, your, if we change the economic structure, then you could be a good person. But for Christians, um, we're inherently broken. We're inherently broken. Evil lives inside of us. It does not exist outside of us. And so to me, I see this woke culture and religion as extremely anti-Christian. Sure, sure. All, all of those uh, well, it can both be anti-Christian and hyper-Christian or an intensification of, of certain, certain Christian ideas. And, uh, and so I think, I think as Solzhenitsyn has said, the line between good and evil um, doesn't run between classes or parties or groups of people, but it runs through every single human heart. And, uh, and, um, and that, uh, and, and so certainly if, um, if you, if you say, uh, if you say that we're all, um, prone to doing evil things, that none of us are perfect, that, uh, that leads to a very different perspective where from evil is just attributed to certain classes or certain groups. So in that sense, the woke thing is anti-Christian. I, I would say it is it is an um, it is an intensification, though, because so much of the language is this um, you know, is this highly moralizing uh, language, and uh, and you know it's it's a maybe it's a hypocritical form of Christianity. It's virtue signaling, but it it is um, you know, and, and of course I, th I think something like this happened with you know mainline Christianity in the, in the 20th century, where you know the the, the mainline churches in, in the U.S. basically. Um, you, you sort of think they traded theology for politics, and you know you, nobody would go to church, but you know they they would sort of uh, they'd sort of fill, you know, um, they, they take over the government or so, something like that. Yeah, um, you know, you touched on earlier, which you said it is it is it is Christian in a way that it's it's uh, well you didn't say it was dogmatic, but it is dogmatic, uh, but it also embraces victimhood. Um, because Christ was the one who introduced that, and and uh, Christianity is anti mythology, as you uh, as you spoke of. I want to talk about victimhood culture, and I think everyone's aware that we live in this victimhood culture. Um, in 2015, the Atlantic wrote uh, uh, an article: "The Rise of the Victimhood Culture and the Ascendancy of This New Moral Code." Um, you know. I think you've talked about how something happened in the 60s. Everybody became hippies. Yes, there was a sexual revolution. There was a counterculture, uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But I trace this back to something more simple. I'm sure many of you disagree with me, but I trace it back to taking prayer out of schools in the 60s. Here's what that prayer was. It was very innocuous. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee. And we beg thy blessings upon our parents, our teachers, and their country. Super simple. But what we did with the kids was we gave them a sense of safety, right? Somebody great was actually watching over them. And we also gave them a sense of gratitude, right? And we took that prayer out of school, and now they're getting kids to meditate and have prayer and great gratitude journals. And gratitude is actually really good. It releases all these... Uh, uh, oxytocin, the feel-good hormones. So when we took kids out of school, and this goes back to your thinking too, about once we took this transcendent, I'm sorry, kids out of school, uh, God out of school, when we take God out or this transcendent... I think, I think it would be good being, to take the kids out of school, actually. <laughs> That's happening too. <laughs> um, anyway, 
Um, it's a Freudian slip, but we'll yeah, talk yeah. about psychology in a little bit. Uh, our school is okay. Thank goodness. You know, no mandates. Thank goodness. Um, so, but when we took the, when we took God out of the school, we took this prayer, then all of a sudden we left kids to compare themselves to others. We left them to focus so much and obsess about them, their own identity, which is a bad thing. Um, when we taught them to understand good and evil, um, the yardstick would be people in front of them or things. Um, and groups. And so then we saw this creation of safe places because, well, you had to be saved from some evil outside of you because it didn't exist inside of you. And of course, um, these people have grown up. I think Helen touched on this a little bit, but, you know, Jonathan Haidt wrote about this in his book, The Coddling of the American Mind, this safetyism culture, George Will called these bubble wrap children. Now they've grown up because Jonathan Haidt wrote about them. They were in college, 2010. Now they're in call, and now they're in working in the workforce. Now they're in government, and now they're trying to create safe places everywhere. Right? They want to be safe. We want to save people from eviction. We want to save people from un unvaccinated. Me, so we have the safetyism culture now, um, and it comes back from taking prayer out of school. Um, well, look, there, let me let me um, let me not, 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 not go on that topic, but let me let me try uh, um, taking this in a slightly different dimension. Where I. Um, you know, there is obviously one way where you can describe Marxism or wokeism as somehow, you know, reductionist and materialist. Uh, but I, I think uh, we, we should also think of them as, as, you know, in some ways, you know, ideological or spiritual or, or, um, or something like this. And, uh, you know, the, you know one, one of the ways I always think of this is that, um, you know, in, um, you know in, in July of 1969, you know, we landed on the moon. And then three weeks later, we had Woodstock. And with the benefit of hindsight, that's when you know, technology stopped and um, you know, progress slowed down and, and the hippies took over the country. And the, the shift, you know, and I think there, there was a way in which the sort of, you know, technical scientific impetus, you know, there, there was something about the Apollo space mission that was probably somehow more materialistic. It was about rockets and fuel and getting the calculations right, not making any mistakes, making sure there was enough oxygen in the space suit. And there was something about um, the hippies that was actually, um, you know, this, this weirdly anti-materialist move. Or, or to put it in another dimension, um, it was a shift from exteriority to interiority. And, um, and that, uh, you know, I think there's sort of all these different ways that we've um, moved into ourselves in the last uh, 50 years. And it's... Uh, it's 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 certainly true of you know um, yoga and meditation and uh, there's probably a version you know there probably are all kinds of you know um, psychological psychopharmacological psychedelic parapsychological uh, types of interventions uh, you know the 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 line I always like to quote is uh, from uh, Milton's uh, Paradise Lost it's um, the mind is its own place and of itself can make a hell of heaven and a heaven of hell. And this is, um, you know, it's what Satan says when he gets sent from heaven to hell. It's, it doesn't matter. It's just a state of mind. And, um, and then probably the thing that's, uh, you know, uh, that one should ask is, is that actually true? You know, to what, to what extent is the mind its own place and to what extent is the external reality the much more important thing? And, um, and I, I, I tend to think there's something about, yeah, the, the, the sort of shift to interiority as, uh, as something that's, you know, um, been sort of um, both overrated, you know, un unhealthy, crazy in all these ways. I had a, I had a set of conversations with uh, Jordan Peterson a few years ago where I always thought he was too, way too psychological. And it was, um, and, or maybe you can, you know, maybe... maybe Maybe a way to um, talk about psychology is that you know psychology was developed in the early 20th century as you know how, how do we you know if, if you don't have external things if you don't I mean, maybe an external thing is God or religion or or something like that if you don't have external things that encourage people to be good how do you how do you create internal mechanisms to make people good or to you know for people to control themselves or to be controlled and um, and I think of I, I think of psychology as as, as something like that, and then, and then we can get into a much longer discussion, you know, 
you know, does it work at all? Or, you know, if it works, you know, is it, is it, uh, is it more good than bad? Um, and I think uh, it's, it's sort of like an interesting, complicated history where it probably always gets advertised as personal transformation. You go see a psychi psychologist, and it will be a way for you to personally transform yourself. So you don't believe in religion anymore, but um, the, psycho the psychologist will do this. And then I, th I think, sort of this is sort of like maybe a, a common pattern, would be that after years of therapy, you're just really exhausted, you're sick of spending all this time, wasting all this money, you kind of dislike your therapist, you're bored with them, and, um, and it sort of crashes from self-transformation into self-acceptance. And after years and years of therapy, or psychedelic drugs, or whatever, you know, the equivalent of or meditation, or yoga, or breathing exercises, um, after years of this, you conclude um, everything's fine and you don't need to change at all. And, and maybe that's true, but it's just very odd, where it's, the marketing was 180 degrees the opposite of, you know, of what, what ultimately happens. And then, so I think psychology is another, another version of, of this, and there's probably a whole set of phenomena like this that I would, I would loosely wrap under the shift from you know, exteriority to interiority. And again, there's some version of interiority you know, is maybe good. I think we've gone way too far. I think on that note, um, I was going to bring up mental health because that's, a, that's the area I'm interested in, digital health, uh, lots of investments going in there. I do see a silver lining that we're putting so much, so much money behind this around digital therapeutics, behavioral therapies. You know, we're moving away from, well, psychedelics, I guess, is uh, um, that's pretty popular, but psychotropics. Um, we're moving away from uh, psychotropics, which have so many side effects. So I see a silver lining there. But here's here's something that uh, that someone Jordan Peterson quotes often. Carl Jung and his dictum is: "With a little moral uh, awareness, we wouldn't need psychotherapy." So it's really interesting that we're moving in this direction that people are focused on mental health. I spoke to someone now who said, well, 2020 was a boom for mental health. Yes, for mental health companies. Um, but what, what I'm concerned about is our approach. Are we doing it the right way? If we are just applying positive psychology and um, this Freudian view of the world or Nietzschean view of the world, which is rise above it, right, um, and, and not this other view of the, this world which internalizes your inherent brokenness. And, and so I'll give you an example. I spoke with the head of innovation at um, the American Psychiatric Association, and I said, if everyone just understood that they were broken, would we have fewer mental disorders? And she said, yes. And people can't get around that. And so I'm wondering, even though we're focused on it now, we have this whole industry focused on it, and many of you probably know Lyra Health was $4 billion in, in March, and January it was $2 billion. I mean, people are throwing money at this space, but are we even answering the right questions and approaching it the right way? Well, um, look, I think, I think there's always there's, the questions about specific interventions, whether you know, there, there probably are versions of them that are you know, better than nothing, um, you know, um, you know, there probably are things that are halfway between, you know, psychology and um, and religion. So I don't know something like Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, is that because it's 1930s? I think we have to concretize this to, yeah. to talk about this, you know, more coherently. So um, you know, it's we don't really know what to do about alcoholism. Very severe problem for people who have it. Very hard to change. Um, you know, I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous works that well. It probably does work better than. Most of the other stuff we've come up since the 1930s, maybe it's too psychological, maybe it's, maybe it's, it's still somewhat religious, maybe that's, you know, you, you can't do it yourself, you have to have a higher power. So, but, um, but uh, it is, um, yeah, I, I think it's just in general, this, this mess where, where um, these, uh, these things are, are very, very hard to do. I think probably, um, you know, my, my, um, you know, my, a speculative theory on this is that that uh, that anything for for transformation to really work, um, you have to actually uh, believe that it's possible. And if it's just a purely internal drama, there's some kind of a look-ahead function you have where it's it's uh, it's it's not quite going to happen. And 
And so I, I, I suspect a lot of these things, you know, they're, you know, you know you're, you're trying to simulate uh, a religious conversion, and it's, you know, it's, yeah, probably religious conversion is, is a way that, uh, that uh, you, you, you really are able to change. But uh, psych a psychological simulation, you know, might get you some stuff, prob probably, probably doesn't, doesn't work in, in many cases. But I think, yeah, I think there's sort of our, you know, our, our versions like this. I think sometimes this stuff can be very powerful and, um, and you know, and very bad, too. You know, it's, uh, so if, if we, you know, I, I mean, I've invested in some psychedelic drug companies. I, I, I think there probably are, you know, specific in interventions to addiction where we just don't know what works. And there's something where maybe, maybe taking these things once, you know, in a controlled setting, um, you know, jars people and they, they get some, some perspective and, and, and that's, that's very helpful. There probably are, you know, a lot of ways this stuff can, you know, go very haywire where you can think of MK Ultra or the Manson family where, you know, they just gave people LSD and uh, told them, you know, the world was coming to an end and so they might as well go out and kill a bunch of people. And, uh, and so there's, there's sort of uh, a w complicated question, you know, what messaging, what the package is that uh, gets, gets put in. This is, again, probably way too, way too polemical, but, uh, you know, I, always, I think of, you know, maybe, maybe the, the um, paradigmatic version of psychology gone berserk in the, in the 20th century was, was Nazi Germany, where you can maybe describe Nazi Germany as a psychological event from beginning to end. And it was, you know, it was you know, in many ways similar to communism, but it was also, you know, it was, it was a somewhat different phenomenon where it had more of a spiritual dimension. You know, the, prop, the propaganda thing was important in a way that it wasn't in the Soviet Union. It was sort of a Goebbels-type figure. You had nothing equivalent to that in, in Stalinist Russia. So there was, there, there was this sort of incredible you know, psychological or psychopharmacological dimension to it. And it somehow started with uh, convincing everybody that you're going to take over the world. And then at some point, everyone became convinced that they all deserve to die. And they both were sort of partially self-fulfilling uh, self -fulfilling prophecy. So it was, it was powerful, but uh, definitely uh, more, more evil than good. So I was going to go back to the victimhood culture to really just wrap that up. But since we're talking about uh, technology, and we probably have to touch on this, but you sort of touched on it, which is sort of this uh, misinformation. Um, now, just disclaimer, Peter is on the board of Facebook, so he can't really answer any questions about Facebook. But there's a lot of censorship lately. YouTube uh, took down 130,000 videos. Obviously, there's many people being canceled. Um, so I guess the question is, um, what can companies do? And how do we, and this is the company side, not the government, what can companies do to uh, resolve misinformation because clearly we have different versions of truth um, out there, which everybody is aware of. Uh, how do companies do that then? Well, again, obviously, if, if you could answer this question, you'd solve problems for a whole bunch of the big tech companies uh, right, right now. Um, look, there, there are all these, these places where, um, where I would, you know, I don't fully agree with everything that, you know, all the big tech companies in Silicon Valley have done, um, to put it mildly, um, including, including Facebook. And, uh, and I think there's probably some degree to which they've systematically gotten this balance wrong. You know, it's, again, the two-front war, too much um, against misinformation, um, not enough um, fighting excess dogmatism. And um, it's sort of like, it's like what the scientists do, it's what the universities do, it's what, you know, um, the sort of, um, screwed up elite consensus in our society does. And in some ways, you know, they're, they're um, sort of uh, very, very deeply linked to it. Um, you know, if I, had, if I had to defend them, you know, the, the partial defense I would, I would give is that I, I do think it's a little bit unfair to, to um, turn um, single companies into the scapegoat for this whole thing because I think it's, you know, it is um, equally, let's say, a problem with our government, with our deep state, with... Um, with the media companies, um, the mainstream media, it is, uh, it, is, it is also, you know, I think a problem with the universities. So I think it is sort of a, um, and then it's somehow it's, it's always a little bit too easy to just, uh, you know, to just blame the, the tech companies. Uh, certainly in, in a, you know, five years ago, in a context relative to the rest of our society, so relative to the, the other elite institutions, let's say universities, um, administrative, governmental, and let's say um, 
mainstream media, um, I think um, the, the range of debate, the range of discussion on the internet was way wider than it was allowed in all these others. It has been um, dialed back. I think that's, you know, that's very unfortunate, very bad. I think it's still, I think it is still, um, it still is uh, wider than these other institutions allow. And that's, you know, that is part of the reason these, these companies, you know, there, there's, there are two different, you know, the, the conservatives attack these companies because they're, you know, not allowing enough freedom of speech. And uh, the, the left attacks them for still allowing way too much. And they're, they're still allowing way more than all these, these other institutions. So it's, it's, it's you know, it's very, it's, it's the, polit the politics of it are very tricky to navigate. But I, I would say it's just, again, it's just in the context of, of this sort of shift towards a one-party state in our whole society across the board. Well, well that's, you know, it's not, it's, you know, it's, yeah, there, 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 there are things we can say that are screwed up at, at Google or Facebook or these individual companies, but it's, um, it's, it's probably, you know, much, you know, uh, and maybe there's a problem with big tech. You know, I think, I think a lot of the problems are, you know, ex are, are functions of an even bigger government and an even bigger state that, uh, that um, is, is using these companies to, to channel things. You know, if, for example, if, um, you know, um, as, as, a, as a libertarian, you know, if the tech companies were simply opposed to our government, that would, you know, that would be, you know, maybe that's not a healthy thing, but it would be a type of check and balance, and, um, and that would be, you know, that would be, that would be good. It's, in, in practice, they end up, you know, uh, under pressure from, you know, um, a whole bunch of different state actors in the U.S., other countries, to, um, to skew things towards the governmental line. And, and you know, the, the, the technological, the sort of example of a dissenting technology where I think it is purely anti-governmental and uh, in a way that's very different from, let's say, uh, a big tech is, uh, is something like crypto, where, you know, it's always this, you know, I think there's always this question about, you know, why is Satoshi's identity unknown? And it's because, well, if we knew who it was, the government would arrest him and maybe some very, very bad things would happen to him. And I have a whole speculative history of, um, of you know, that e-gold was the precursor to Bitcoin and e-gold e was the sort of encrypted uh, anonymous gold uh, certificates that you could trade. And they had servers distributed in Dubai and Iceland all over the world. But it was a company with officers based in southern Florida, you know, um, and, um, and – um, you know, we, we made them interchange. We, I met them on the beach in Anguilla in February of 2000, and, you know, it was, we're, we're beginning the revolution against central banks on the beach in Anguilla. We're going to make PayPal interoperable with eGold, and we're going to blow up all the central banks starting right now. You know, three months later, there was sort of a lot of fraud. We disconnected eGold. You know, they, they, they sued me for libel. It was all, sort of an adversarial relationship. We, we settled. You know, we always, you never negotiate with terrorists except in every specific instance. We gave them some money, made them go away. Um, that was 2002. But you know, fast forward to 2008, and, you know, the people sort of got arrested. And I, I think they didn't go to jail, but they agreed to just uh, not do this anymore, to shut down the company and, uh, and, and go away. And I think that, uh, you know, my, my, my sort of theory on Satoshi's identity was that Satoshi was on that beach in Anguilla, and he saw eGold, and, um, and Bitcoin was the answer to eGold, and Satoshi learned that you had to be anonymous and you had to – not have a comp even a company was even a company even a corporate form was too governmentally linked and gave the government too many hooks and so you had to have an algorithm that was not a corporation and you had a per had to have a person who was completely unknown and it's a, it's even the same it's a computer word and a money word Bitcoin e gold um, I, I, anyway um, and um, and that's but that's what I think um, technology that uh, that really challenges the, the state. Would, would look like, and, and certainly the big tech companies don't, don't quite look like that. Well, we talked to, about big tech and misinformation, but there's also um, government, which I think, um, I think there's a lot of, I think you're right that there's a lot of demonization around these big tech companies. It's really around capitalism. Um, and we've had a lot of those accusations around big pharma. We've had a lot of those accusations around uh, tobacco companies. But with big tech now, it's misinformation. And um, 
I actually like sometimes some government intervention in some cases, like if you guys are from New York City, do you remember Bloomberg kind of banned those big sodas? I thought that was pretty good for kids. Um, but largely I don't really like government intervention, and in this case I think it's actually not a good idea because, as you mentioned, it would be sort of a form of ministry of truth. And so with regards to misinformation, I'm not quite sure we should have government regulation, even though some people are calling for it. Yeah, again, I, uh, I won't repeat what I said before, but, yeah, it's just, it's just uh, um, Ministry of Truth sounds much worse than, you know, a problem of some misinformation. I will take uh, – I'll take all the, you know, QAnon and Pizzagate conspiracy theories every day over, over the Ministry of Truth. Um, I um, – let me see what else. Yeah, uh, but I, I think that uh, um, not, not, not sure. I have not, not that much more to say on that. Okay. You know, I think. I think. That, let me. See, let me say one thing on the on the. Um, the you know, the, it, it it does. You know, there is obviously, and there's always a question how one you know diagnoses these things, and there, there is you know this. Um, there is you know um, some kind of pushback to socialism, a push against capitalism in our society. There's some sense that. You know the capitalist things, you know, and I think I think we have to maybe you know be a little bit nuanced and say there are all these ways that the, the capitalist stuff has not been working quite as well. And this is this is again where you know I I, I probably um, um, disagree some with sort of the you know happy clappy libertarians who just want to say that you know, everything is wonderful and getting better all the time. And if if the truth is that we've had this period of relative stagnation. Where there's been, you know, relatively little progress, um, that it's, you know, it's not totally zero sum, but it's more, you know, it's more zero sum um, than uh, than is desirable. And you know, in that sort of a world, you know, there's a loser for every winner, and there's there's some kind of a um, there's some kind of a dynamic where um, tech has been the only game of town, and you know, it's it's been somewhat positive some, but it's also to some extent come at the expense of of everybody else, and that's that's the that's the unhealthy, broader dynamic that I, I see playing out. That it's it's a it's 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 a, you know, it, it is a feeling of you know relative stagnation. And this is you know again I, I don't think it justifies it, but this is sort of for example why I think the media is naturally you know opposed to big tech because there is a part of the tech thing that has undercut the business models of you know the old monopoly media companies and um, and they don't like it. And I think they were, you know, there were all sorts of things that were wrong about them, and they're resentful people, and they, you know, um, you know, they shouldn't, uh, you know, they, sh they should probably just do something else instead of, you know, stewing in the resentment all the time. Um, but, but it is, it is sort of a, it is, it is also a structural problem, and we should acknowledge that. So, so yes, we could. We're, we're probably seeing economic stagnation, but maybe cultural and political stagnation, maybe not. Um, there are a lot of people who, well, first of all, we talked about guilt quite a bit. We talked about victimhood, um, and we talked about uh, a little bit of guilt, I think. We talked about guilt. Um, but the um, one of the reasons why we would have guilt, and uh, this comes from Nietzsche, is because we don't have a God, and without a God, there's guilt. Uh, and Nietzsche also said that um, without a god, we would be either closer to um, hopeless nihilism or totalitarianism. And I talked to a lot of people on sort of the left of center who would say that we're nowhere even near totalitarianism on the left. You know, AOC is just a fringe character, um, and that's just a fantasy. So where do you think we are? Well, I... Um I, I always go back and forth on this because there is certainly a part of all the, um, you know, tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying not very much that is, you know, the hate factory that is much of, you know, um, let's say the Internet. Um, um, where I'm probably, if you held a gun up to my head, I, I, I always tempted to say that it's not quite as, real as it seems that most of the time what happens on Twitter stays on Twitter. It's just, yes, this crazy hate factory, but it's, um, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's mostly kayfabe. It's mostly LARPing. It's mostly, um, you know, you have your, um, 
you have, it's like in Orwell's 1984, you have your two minutes of hate at Twitter, and if you want the sort of elite conspiracy theory, Twitter is an elite conspiracy to sort of, um, you know, the, sort of to keep the workers in their boring jobs, and so they have two minutes where they get really angry on Twitter, and then they go back to their boring jobs, and sort of a, a, a social control mechanism or so, something like that. So that's, that's, what I, that's what I'm inclined to believe, that most of the time these things are, um, let's say, substitutes for actual revolutionary political action rather than complements, uh, to use the economics terminology. However, just to take your side of it, the other side, um, you know, there is some chance that I'm wrong about this. And, um, and if I'm wrong, um, you can't, you have to do something earlier rather than later. And, uh, and probably, you know, the, the, you know, the lesson I take from the, the 20th century is that, uh, that um, um, you know, if, if we're going to use a precautionary principle, you know, um, we should, um, you know, it often gets used with AI or with climate change or all these things where, you know, there's a chance something's going to go really haywire and uh, you have to stop it before it becomes real. I think if there's a place for the precautionary principle, it's, uh, I would put the number one place for it, incipient totalitarianism. Because um, once these things really snowball, they can't be stopped. This is like, I know this is again, hasn't used the Nazi analogies, but I always feel they're sort of overwrought. But, uh, you know, 1933, it's simply too late. And then, you know, 1923, you know, uh, Mr. H has just, you know, uh, a few followers, has a ridiculous looking mustache. Everyone thinks it's silly. And, you no, know, 1923 was your last chance to stop it. And so there is probably, uh, uh, there is something where, um, I, I, I am in favor of a very intense fight against all forms of incipient totalitarianism because, um, you know, it's hard to know exactly what the odds are of it snowballing. Once it snowballs, it's simply too late. And I, I'm seeing these incipient signs in education. And um, we saw that now the FBI is investigating parents, calling them, what are they calling them? Domestic terrorists uh, for getting involved in schools. Uh, or their kids' education, as I said, I feel like it's a parent's obligation. I would probably really like to see prayer back in school, but that's probably dogmatic, though it would do wonders for the character building, I believe. Um, but so short of putting prayer back in schools um, and having some sort of monolithic educational program, um, it seems like we have to, your idea is to expand choice maybe give vouchers to people to determine where they want to send their schools. What, what should we do with the education system? Um, well, again, I, look, I'm, 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 <laughs> this is always, I'm always much better at um, so analyzing problems and, and telling you what to do about them. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I feel like I've been guilty of this, you know, all, all afternoon here in some ways. So just uh, maybe just acknowledge, um, no, look, the, the school system is bad. It's been bad for a really long time. It maybe. Maybe, maybe it's healthy that the, all this stuff is happening now because um, it's more transparently bad. You know, it's, it's, it's probably, I don't know, probably critical race theory, you know, is, 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 is silly and ridiculous. Um, but, you know, not learning how to read or how to, how to do math, you know, is, you know, maybe equally bad, worse, almost as bad. Take your pick. And, um, and, uh, and so, uh, so, yeah, one of the... One of the things that's uh, that's that's important is to somehow you know is to somehow puncture this this educational um, bubble in in any way you know in any way we can and that's and that that, that that's probably you know the first step towards towards uh, towards solving it you know I I continue to think that um, there's you know there's one way in which um, there's a very severe K through 12 problem because that's sort of where, you know, um, it's we, we can sort of obviously see it. It's um, the brainwashing starts. It's very you know there's all these sort of problems about K through 12 education. I probably still find myself focused as you know the core of what I believe to be the enemy are the universities, and um, and there's a way that uh, um, it's it's the dominance of of the universities that that somehow needs to be needs to be broken um, and um, and that sort of all the deformations of K through 12 are, can be thought of as you know rationalizations or systematizations of just tracking um, the kids to get into college and so 
if you if you don't if you don't um, change the importance of universities or um, or change the universities or break them, um, I think the you know the K through 12 thing will always be some sort of a losing battle. I mean, may, maybe maybe politically correct woke talk, like it's 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 not. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's helpful in life. But if all that matters is um, when you're 18, what college you get into. If that's, if that's all that matters in life, then, um, then these K through 12 schools are doing their job by, by not teaching math or reading, but uh, just uh, indoctrinating people, people in wokeness. So, so I, think, I think the universities are, you know, are the, the, the core problem. You know, the, the, the analogy I've, I've used before is that uh, they are in some sense um, you know, uh, at this point, as corrupt as the Catholic Church was, you know, 500 years ago on the eve of the Reformation, uh, and you can sort of just transpose, you know, all these uh, theological categories onto the university system, where we have a you know, system of indulgences in the form of, you know, exponentially rising student debt, 300 billion in 2000, 2 trillion now, keeps going up very, you know, faster than, you know, nominal GDP or inflation or whatever you want to want to compare it to. Uh, you have um, you have you have the sort of um, you have this uh, this clerisy of uh, of uh, professors who uh, seem to you know not do very much um, and the sort of corrupt clerical class. Um, you have a theory of salvation. Uh, the soteriology is that uh, you know if you don't um, if you don't get into a good college, you'll end up in a bad place. You know you go to Yale or you go to jail. So there's sort of a whole theory of soteriology linked to it. And, um, and it's, of course, it's universal. It is, it is a single unitary form of truth. And in that sense, it's, it's in some sense, the atheist church. It's this, you know, this, this, uh, the successor to the, the universal Catholic church in a way, but, but it's, uh, it's the atheist church. And, uh, and that's, you know, I have nothing against atheism or the church, but the atheist church is too much. I think we're at time for Q&A, but you, you talked about indulges, indulgences. I always thought those uh, virtue signaling signs were a form of indulgence. But <laughs> anyway, um, I think we're time for Q&A. Yes. Yeah, so hi, Peter. Um, Marshall from Lincoln Network. I'll start us off. You missed this part of the conversation, but the vast majority of people here have exited in some form. They left the Bay Area, they left New York City, and they're here. So. How has the last year or so evolved your thinking around exit, voice, and whether or not you can change systems, whether domestically or internationally, based on those choices? Uh, let's see. I am, I am probably um, – yeah, I, um, I am uh, – I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm probably very schizophrenic on it, to be honest, where um, – you know, on the, on the one hand, I think politics is important. It's like the air we breathe that permeates everything, and there's some part of that where you want to be engaged. You want to you you want to be participating in it, and then at the same time, you know, it also is just um, just extraordinarily toxic in all these ways. And um, and yeah, I think that uh, um, and I yeah I, I found myself uh, thinking a lot about the exit versus voice dichotomy, and I'm probably probably about, you know, 80% exit, 20% voice camp, which is probably an incorrect number. It should be like 100 and zero, but I'm probably 80, 80, 20 um, exit over, over voice. Um, you know, um, I, I did a mild version of this in uh, 2018 when I moved from San Francisco to, to Los Angeles. And, um, you know, it, it felt, it felt uh, very, very drastic at the time. And then you know, there were all these questions people asked, you know, um, you know, you know, what did you, why did you move to Los Angeles? You know, what was so great about it? And, you know, and, and, um, and I, any of those sort of answers I can give. But, um, but I think um, the honest answer is somewhat more negative, and I think we should be willing to simply be negative, which is I didn't move to L.A. I moved away from SF. And, um, and again, this is, you know, there are all these, you know, pro-Miami, pro-Florida pro, pro arguments one can give. But... Uh, but I think uh, we should be perfectly fine with, uh, with a negative argument, which is that uh, we moved away from X and X was a bad place. And it's, it's, it's perfectly sufficient to move away from a bad place.
And I would just like to rem- thank everyone who submitted questions. We have let people know, um, and but hopefully we will have extra time for additional questions. So. Hi, Peter. I'm Channing from uh, Hard Tech Miami, and I'm also a recent Miami outside of SF transplant. Uh, so historically, you've been a proponent of libertarian organizations like the Seasteading Institute, but more recently I've seen Founders Fund taking a bearish stance citing uh, political inefficacy. With increasing decentralization through technologies like crypto, Substack, or podcasting like Joe Rogan, the unbundling of education, and new political figures like Blake Masters, what technological trends would you like to start or accelerate to change our country's culture for the better, and what existing trends do you worry will change it for the worse? Thank you. Yeah, I could probably spend an hour just trying to answer that question, but um, uh, I, I, still, uh, I still think there's a lot to be said for just uh, political decentralization and the thing that I think is, um, what, I, what I still see as the incredible silver lining of this last 20 month uh, crisis is that uh, people have been able to move and um, and um, and uh, you know um, you know may, maybe San Francisco maybe New York will rebound. I am I am hopeful that the sort of um, the bubble of the mega cities is over. And that, you know it, it, it had been there had been something generative about these places. There had been these positive network effects, um, but at some point it, it you know it went way you know way uh, way more from the 51 percent democracy to the 99 percent North Korea direction and. Um, and uh, at this point, just just decentralization is 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 healthy. There were all these versions where two years ago it it felt literally hard. It was you know the seasteading thing felt hard because you know are you really going to get a critical mass of people to move? You know this was one of the early seasteading efforts in the 2000s was this uh, Sealand project, which was a radio tower in the North Sea, where you know eight very committed people moved into a, uh, an abandoned radio tower in the middle of the North Sea with no shower and uh, 6,000 square foot of living space on, in the whole country. And um, they were sort of cut off from the rest of the world for six months while, you know, it was sort of a stormy weather in the North Sea. And uh, they were you know, extremely committed, but there was something about that that, uh, that d- did not feel scalable. At, at this point, um, <laughs> I, at, at, at this point, I'm, I'm much more hopeful about... Uh, about the uh, the decentralization than I was, you know, a few years ago. Um, certainly, as a venture capitalist, um, it seems like you, you can. Uh, it's it's much easier um, doing things, and, and there probably are all these these versions where um, where where it's uh, yeah, it's, it's simply going to work. I you know, tech, the technology question. I, I guess you know, one one extreme formulation on technology is always the technology is neutral. It's not a g- intrinsically good or intrinsically bad thing. I don't. I'm not sure that's quite true. I do think that they have you know, technologies have a have a certain valence, and you know the the um, the extreme two extreme technologies in my mind are uh, that you know I think um, you know if, if we say that crypto is libertarian and that it is it is fundamentally a force for decentralization, uh, then I think we should also be willing to say that AI, um, especially in the sort of low tech um, surveillance form. Is essentially communist, and um, and so if you want to frame it as a as a you know as a technological race between freedom and totalitarianism or decentralization and centralization, um, uh, yeah, I, I want I want um, I want the crypto decentralized world to work, and uh, I'd like us to, you know, uh, I'm not, not sure sabotage or outlaw AI. That doesn't sound very libertarian, but I I um, I would like those people to be. Um, less psychologically motivated, and to think about how they are, how they are, um, how they're working on the technology that's going to destroy the world, and maybe um, maybe that will demotivate them, and they'll work on it more slowly. Peter, you should probably talk it's about psychological. You know, that, you know, power of positive thinking doesn't work, but power of negative thinking I think does work. So that's a sort of <laughs> psychological intervention that might work. You should probably talk about how AI can be complementary too, though. So we can advance AI as long as we can make it complementary. To what we're doing, I think that's what you're interested in. Well, I, you know, I, I I don't really know how to how to how to actually um, think about it. There's there was certainly a Silicon Valley debate about AI, um, you know, six seven years ago, where it was it was about AGI, you know, artificial general intelligence, was sort of somehow this um, this um, superhuman um, 
intelligence would be indistinguishable from God for all practical purposes. And, um, and I, I was struck the other day how that debate has actually just disappeared. And, you know, there was an extreme intent. You know, it was Elon was, you know, you're, you're summoning the demon. And then, you know, Larry Page was working on building it with DeepMind at Google. And then, you know, Elon's not talking about it anymore. And, and uh, Larry's off to Fiji and doesn't seem to be working on it quite as hard anymore. And, um, and so I, I was, I was and, and, and then it's sort of an interesting question, why, you know, why has the AGI discussion, you know, completely collapsed? Um, or, you know, another, yeah. And um, the speculative answer, you know, I would, I would, I would give you is, um, you know, there's always these, you know, metaphysical, philosophical questions. Is it possible? Can you actually replace humans with AI? Is it complementary or is it a substitute? You know, uh, what, what, is, what is actually possible? But I think... Um, I think the disturbing thing that's happened is that uh, is that basically AGI, um, you know, if we say that we get to this artificial general, it's, it's not even, it's, maybe it's wrong, it's not even wrong. And it's not even wrong because maybe you get to AGI in X years, but on the path to AGI in X over two years, you get to um, surveillance AI, you know, a communist um, totalitarian technology, facial recognition used to control people, um, that will be used by a small number of people to, um, to control lots of other people. And one of the side effects of the surveillance AI is that it will be used to make sure nobody builds the AGI. And so if you're worried about AGI, it's like a, you know, it's a psychological form of displacement where you're, you know, it's, or it's like a magic trick where you're, you're not actually paying attention to the thing that really matters. And, and I think somehow that's, um, that's, that's gotten, you know, much more, you know, much more into the consciousness on some level over the last uh, last six or seven years, um, and and uh, and you know obviously we could speculate maybe there's some pathways to get to AGI that don't go through surveillance AI where it's you know it's it's complementary or it's, it's, it's somehow orthogonal. It doesn't seem to be that way because there's always you know this talk about big data and you get the big data by surveilling all these people and monitoring them and knowing more about them than they know about themselves. So it has a sort of you know extremely totalitarian, anti-Cartesian kind of a, a feel to it. And so if, you know, all paths to AGI lead to surveillance AI, lead through surveillance AI, and if surveillance AI will be used by some people to control other people and also used to not make, build AGI, then maybe all we should be worried about is surveillance AI and not AGI. And I think that's, you know, that's the, the shift that's happened. There's sort of a, you know, there's sort of a rationalist undercurrent in uh, Silicon Valley, um, which uh, you know, I was peripherally involved with um, 15, 16 years ago, where you know, a lot of the one, one of the core issues was friendly AI and how, you know, how do we build this, um, this this friendly AI? And it sort of struck me, you know, it is it's all sort of gone from utopian to luddite. They, they don't believe in any of this anymore. It's it somehow has completely devolved in the last uh, few years. And the, the sort of the speculative um, geopolitical theory, I would say, was that the atheist rationalists and there's a computer version, but you could also say Sam Harris or Christopher Hitchens or this, this whole group of people. You know, in 2005, um, they, you know, they were a politically correct way to be anti-Islamic. And uh, it was maybe a cowardly way, but um, it was, you know, you were, you were against this, uh, this um, bad, irrational God, and that's you're sort of against Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and then it's, it's really Islam that, that's in practice, the one you're against, but it sort of was a politically correct way to be anti-Muslim. And, um, and there was sort of some need for that in 2005 and it had a certain amount of resonance. But, you know, the problem in 2021 is not, you know, fundamentalist Islam. The problem is um, Chinese totalitarian communism. And, um, and, um, and they have nothing to say to the CCP. And AGI, yeah, the AGI didn't look like yeah, AI didn't look like it had something to do with the Taliban, but um, it does look like it has something to do with the CCP. And that's why um, if, you, if you're talking about AGI in 2020, 2021, you're, you're probably just an apologist for the CCP. But that's, that's, that's an ad hominem argument, but I think it still has some legitimacy. Hi, uh, I'm Erica Gemma. I am, hi, Bambi and Peter, you guys are awesome. Uh, I'm over here, sorry. Yeah, sure. 
Hey, everybody. All right, uh, I'm Erica Gemma. I founded the first Bitcoin center in Miami, and I now have a Miami-based blockchain venture fund. Um, I have two questions. The first is, who do you think is Satoshi, now that you said you th know who you think it is? Uh, and, then, and then the second is, uh, what is the top criteria you use when investing in projects? Are there any specific questions you always ask a startup to gauge if they're a good fit? Um. Uh, I'm always well. Uh, I, I've, I've speculated in who Satoshi is a great. I, did, I didn't say. I, I just said that I, you know, I, I, I thought that um, that Satoshi had, um, you know, had been on that beach in Anguilla, and there were like 200 people who were there. So there's one, one of 200. I, I, um, I haven't gone back and looked at who it was, and um, that's 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 the direction I would explore if you were if you were to to to, to try to try to figure it out. Um, but I think I think certainly my uh, my um, libertarian bias is I'm I'm pro Satoshi and I, I somehow feel um, speculating on it more um, is, is 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 taking the anti crypto side and so I don't actually want to speculate on it too much beyond um, beyond the, the the basic narrative I, I gave um, I don't know the uh, you know I, I'm always anti formula anti system anti a formula for investing in companies so I I know that it's, it's the um, you know, um, it's, I think it's Anna Karenina where it's, you know, all, um, all, um, you know, all happy families are alike and all unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. And I think something like the opposite is true of companies, you know, um, you know, all great companies are special in a, in a good way. And then, you know, all, all failed companies somehow are generic and, and, and failed. So if you, if you, if you, you have to somehow ask, figure out what's distinctive, what's unique, and um, and uh, if, if you have too generic a formula, it's it's going to go it's going to go haywire. So, I mean, you know, there are things about the founders, the market, the Fed, but I, I think often the greatest companies don't even they don't even have a narrative that fits because even a narrative of what a company is doing um, uh, is, is is always you're just one of um, one of X, one of many. And um, and so you know if you, if you sort of uh, look at Google in 1998 and people who said it's just another search engine there were many different search engines and um, and um, it was actually no it was it was machine powered search so it was it was a it was unique they didn't even have that word for probably a decade afterwards so uh, so you're always trying to find you know what's what's essential and unique and um, and that's uh, and that's, you know, that, that you have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Hi, Peter. My name is Matt Harder. I run a small democratic innovation firm called Civic Trust. Thanks for being here. It feels like the rising tensions between not just China and the U.S., but the governance models they represent, authoritarianism versus democracy, will characterize the next several decades. I'm sure we're all in the camp that would like to see democracy succeed but it feels as late like our side is the one in retreat, increasingly struggling to show its value on the world stage and lacking vision and leadership. What do you see as the core tenets of a U.S. strategy to win the soft power war with China in the coming decades? Um, man, it's, it's, uh, I, I mean, there's so, so many different versions of this, but um, I, I would say maybe just to, Disagree with the framing of the question as as the first part of a strategy is that uh, if you frame it in overly historicist ways, where if you say that um, you know China is destined to win or it's on the winning side of history, or conversely, you know it's this completely screwed up system that you know will you know it's just going to collapse under its own weight. Um, um, I think both extremely optimistic or extremely, sorry, extremely pessimistic or extremely optimistic ways of of framing it um, have the same effect of being anti um, um, us needing to do very much. And so um, you know, extreme pessimism, there's nothing we can do. Extreme optimism, there's nothing we need to do. And, um, and maybe, may, maybe they're true, but I, I am very suspicious of, um, of any sort of extreme formulation because it's, um, it, uh, it just seems so lazy and seems just a sort of uh, go into this vice of of, um, of, of, of of not wanting to do things. And, and, and so I think 
you know, my, my, my guess is that the, um, perhaps the healthier way to frame it, you know, not sure it's totally true, but the healthier way is that it's, it's very close and we shouldn't be in denial or acceptance. We should be in between. We should be fighting. And it makes, you know, just, it's, it's up to you know, a lot of different, uh, different individual decisions. And even if, you know, and even if China is growing faster than the U.S., you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, it is, it is a, you know, it is also a, you know, we're, we're a somewhat autistic country. China is a really autistic country. And, um, and it is extremely uncharismatic. And, you know, there is, there is, uh, there's some part where, you know, the, the strategic landscape is going to be very fluid and it'll be up to, to what we do. So I would just, I would just start by framing it as, you know, a close battle that will, will go on for decades. There, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Winston, and I'm here with NetChoice. Do you think politicians are educated on contemporary tech issues enough to regulate them? And what can be done to change that? And should lawmakers wait to regulate until they have a greater understanding, or is the time now, as some people argue it is? Well, um, again, not not defending Silicon Valley, the big tech companies. I, mean, I think there's just, you know, uh, um, a lot of things that are far from what I would have done or far from what's optimal. Um, and then, you know, at the, at the same time, uh, um, your, your question probably answers itself where, uh, you know, the, these people just, you know, I, I think they are for the most part still aware enough of how incompetent they are. And so, um, you know, they're probably, you know, I don't know, you know, have all these sort of proposals where, you know, um, Google should publish changes to the search engine algorithm. And, um, and again, if we had a high functioning government, maybe, maybe you could do something with this. I don't think anyone in the government even pushes that idea because they know they're too incompetent to do it. And, um, if you do it, it will just, um, it will just show how incompetent the people in our government are. That's, that's all it will make transparent. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I um, again, it, yeah, just another version of, um, 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 some big problems with, uh, with, with big tech, um, even bigger problems with, with, with um, much bigger government. Hi, Peter and Bambi. Nice to meet you. Um, I do have this question for the both of you. It's going back to the conversation you were having earlier. So um, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned how philosophers were deemed the radicals and free thinkers of society and deep Christianity was the anti-thought. You also mentioned how the pendulum have kind of flipped to where deep Christianity beliefs, especially within the last 20 months, is now the leader of free thought and considered the radicals of society, in a good way, of course. With that in mind, um, one second, what do you think deep Christian parents of this modern society um, should do to take back control of their children's education? Should we go back to a traditional homeschooling model? And if so, should we as a society also dial back on modern feminism to allow parents to take back control and actually teach their kids? Do you want to? I have four kids, so I guess I'll start. Um, I think you should take back control, and I think we've never should have let control go. I think that... Um, now that we've had social distancing and distance learning, I've realized how much I didn't know what my kids were learning. And I was grateful for the opportunity to actually see what, was they, what they were learning. And I'll give you an example. Um, my son had a, um, he had a report that he had to write about all of the great leaders in this country. And he's in, he was in third grade, by the way. And so he had a list of the great leaders he could choose from. And those great leaders were Michelle Obama, Barack Obama, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Cesar Chavez. And, and so she said, well, does anyone, and of course he's on Zoom, so I could hear this. So does anybody have any idea, anyone? And so someone said, Abraham Lincoln. Okay, yeah, he's good. And so he figures he's actually quite uh, aware, my son. And he said, how about Donald Trump? And she said, no, I'm sorry, and kind of shut him down. She said, I'll talk to you later. 
about that. So he insisted, and he said, why? You know, she said, well, you know, we needed to have people who actually did something for the country and somebody I know. And he's like, you don't know who Donald Trump is. Um, and so he ended up having to write, he was able to write his uh, story. And, and basically he wanted to say that, look, school is about um, giving thoughts, new thoughts. And Donald Trump has done a lot for education. I guess a lot of it, she, she basically was saying, she was trying to get out of him um, writing about Donald Trump. So it was, it was either somebody who had to um, support liberty or somebody who had to support education. And so he rattled off all the things that uh, Trump had done for education. So she basically said, okay, you can write about him. So I think that's one thing is take control. Um, but I think it's also about, we're talking a lot about character building. We talked a lot about that in the beginning. And one of my big things for my kids is to not keep them in safe places. I want to, you know, ennoble them with this sort of mode of being that that life is suffering. You know, we have we have this cross, I have this cross. It's about suffering, it's about tragedy, and that's not trying to make my kid live a morbid life. It's about making my kid understand that one, he needs forgiveness because he has very much a lot of ethical faults that, it, that will get him into trouble, um, that a lot of his circumstances, negative ones, are uh, a lot due to him. So I want to teach my kids a self, self of a, uh, sense of agency. So I think you just, you know, I, I think you ground them in those truths, those truths that um, they're pretty responsible for themselves and um and so that's what I, I try to do is just try to give them a sense of agency. And I try to get very much involved in schools. You should get involved with school boards. There's somebody here who can, uh, Clarice, I don't know where you are, but she's, uh, she's supporting 300 school board candidates. I think you should very much get involved with your school boards and, and, and start voicing your opinion because we do have to educate our, educate our kids. And it starts in the home. We can't have government do it. It's your job. It's our job. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm probably still on, on the 80% exit, 20% voice side. So, yes, I think people should, you know, they should um, show up at the school board meetings and scream at all these people. And, um, and um, it's probably, uh, uh, will we'll do some good. Um, and then um, at, the, at, the same, at the same point, I, I sort of wonder whether it's, um, it's, 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 it's really just, um, all permutations of homeschooling that, that should be done, and uh, that uh, you know anything short of that is is not um, not doing justice to the you know the, the the brainwashing and the you know sort of egalitarian homogenization that that goes on, and the, you know the schools are just you know, structurally screwed up. Um, there's a you know he's sort of an extreme writer, but there's the uh, Rush Dooney book from 1963 that I I think it was. His best book, *The Messianic Character of American Education*, he sort of goes through all these different um, educational things, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's it feel, feels very overwrought. But you know, the, the, you know, the, the kindergarten chapter is, is like some silly German woman from the early 19th century invert, invented the idea of a kindergarten. It was like this counterfeit Garden of Eden, where you know, um, you get rid of all the adults and um, and uh, you can start all over. And uh, and there's sort of, and of course, John Dewey features as the the arch-villain uh, with the sort of, you know, um, socialist homogenization of, of public schooling in the New Deal in the 1930s. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 sort of, I sort of wonder whether, um, whether um, it's, again, um, you know, yes, use your voice, scream as much as you want, but, um, but, but be ready to exit, too. You know, um, this is um, Denzel Washington said, teach your kids, kids love, and it doesn't matter what happens around them. So it starts there. Yeah, you can scream all you want, but it starts at home in what you teach your kids. Hey, Peter. This is Ariel oh, over here. This is Ariel DeChapelle. I'm a co-founder with HydraHost. Um, I was rereading your book, and I was wondering uh, if I could pose you a hypothetical, which is suppose you had access to a secret and that secret is that the U.S. dollar hegemony will collapse by the year 2030. 
what would you do to position yourself to survive and thrive in that kind of timeline? Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, um, well, I, I suppose you're, spo you're supposed to just buy Bitcoin. And um, um, I feel like I've um, been underinvested in it. Um, and uh, and, in, and if, in part because, um, you know, I thought this was not a secret, but it was known to everybody. Um, and yet, um, maybe, maybe it isn't. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think, um, uh, I agree, I agree, I agree with your claim. I, I still wonder how much of a secret it is, but maybe it still is enough of a secret. I, you know, the, the, um, if you, if you sort of think of, um, you know, Bitcoin at $66,000, what does it, you know, is it going to go up by maybe, but it, it, it surely tells us that we are at a, you know, at a, at a complete bankruptcy moment for, um, the central banks and uh, at some crisis point for them uh, that, you know, uh, you know, there's, there's the, uh, um, you know, the Wizard of Oz story was sort of this parable on central banking. It's, you know, the wizard is an ounce of gold, the old brick road and Emerald City, everything's seen through the prism of money and the, the scare, you know, the scarecrow is the farmer who has been brainwashed and think he doesn't have a brain so he can't think about monetary policy and, you know, the, you know, the, the, the wicked witch of the East is sort of the Wall Street bankers who uh, have extortionate mortgage rates and so in poetic justice the house falls on the, the mortgage banker. But anyway, it's, it's sort of a populist anti-central banking book. But um, I, I kind of, I've kind of been wondering the last month whether, um, you know, we, we're, we're just about to have a Toto moment with the Fed where the little dog is pulling away the curtain and you see, you know, all the people, and, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, and we've had like two governors resign, two more, you know, probably aren't going to survive. And, um, and uh, it's just, um, yeah, the this, this stuff, you know, the sausage making factory doesn't work when you have YouTube videos of what's going on in the sausage making factory. And, and we are at a, we're at an absolute crisis moment for the Fed. So I, th I think the answer is probably still to go long Bitcoin. And then my only hesitation is that uh, it seems to me that this is a secret that's already known by everybody. But uh, my uh, agreeing with you then, uh, I, I've been wrong about that for a decade. Bambi, closing words? Uh, actually, my closing words was actually going to ask Peter one final question to wrap this up. So... Um, I think Peter touched on this before, which is that when I said that the elites are dogmatic, he said not so much because they're constantly changing their minds. And I feel it's because their identity is um, wrapped up in the narrative or their identity is their idea. And so... Well, they're hyper-dogmatic. It's just not stable. So it's not are, stable, right. Because their unstable. identity, you know, it, it shifts with the narrative, I think. So my question to you is getting back to religion and, um, and culture and also sort of understanding your positioning and what motivates you is, is where do you get your identity? How do you define it? Well, I, I'm, always, I mean, I'm always so bad at even answering these questions. You know, I think, um, I think even identity is always this this um, strange word that, you know, it means two opposite things. It means um, your identity is that which makes you unique and your identity is that which makes you identical, the same as other people. And so, you know, the, you know sort of the insanity of identity politics is that uh, you can use identity as meaning same and you can use it to mean different. And when the word means A and not A, you can go, go anywhere y you want to with it. But, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I would say that um, that uh, you know I, I, I think I think Christianity for me is the anti-identity, where you know your identity is in Christ, but it's not in all these other senses of, of the word identity. And then it's in in that context that uh, you know we can we can um, we can try to you know figure out things about the world. We can figure out things about truth. And, um, and it's not, you know, it's not always just a, a, a social construct as it was for, you know, when Pontius Pilate says, what is truth? It's just, is just a social construct or, um, or is, is it something transcendent? And I think we, we need to somehow always get back to that. Great. And I think when I asked you before, uh, sort of what is your North Star and where do you go to? And, and that's your go-to. So uh, I just want to make sure people understand that. Uh, when they try to understand you. Um, and it's pretty deep. 
Please join me in thanking Peter Thanks, and Bambi for a great conversation. If you, if you exit the same door that you came in and go to your left, directly behind us uh, are some great drinks and opportunities uh, to meet each other and, and continue the conversation. Thank you very much.